Today, we brew on the SS Brewtech SVBS. In this video, I'm going to share with you my first brew day experience on the SS Brewtech SVBS. I did encounter a couple of minor issues that you're definitely going to want to hear about, so make sure that you watch the entire video, especially the part about chilling. Now, before we start the brew day, one of the things that SS Brewtech does recommend is that you clean the unit thoroughly to remove any oil or grease from manufacturing. According to the information from SS Brewtech, they recommend TSP or trisodium phosphate. They don't really give you any recommendations on concentration, but I went with the recommended amount based on the product information, which is half a cup for every two gallons of water. Now, because TSP is kind of like PBW and it's granular, one of the things I recommend is that you do dissolve it before you put it in the kettle, because you certainly don't want the granules getting into the pump as it wouldn't be very good on the impeller, the valves or the seals or anything like that. So to do this, I just filled up a pitcher with some hot water, poured in my entire amount of TSP, one and a half cups, and stirred it thoroughly to dissolve as much of the granules as I could, then I dumped it into the kettle. Now for my cleaning, I decided to go with six gallons of water because that would give me a good amount to be able to wash everything thoroughly as well as recirculate in the basket. Uh, you also wanna make sure that you open all the valves so that you can get the cleaner to flow through all the areas inside the manifold and the pump to thoroughly clean those parts too. SS Brewtech does recommend also passivating the unit and they have a couple of different methods on their website. So be sure to consult their information on passivation. Information on passivation. <laughs> That was a rhyme. <laughs> now, based on the recipe that I'm brewing today, I needed 7.86 gallons of water. Now, if you're new to the channel or haven't seen the video previously, I have an RO system with a reservoir that I dispense my brewing water out of, and I use a controller to precisely measure the amount of water that I need for brewing. I'll put a card up here, as well as a link in the description for the video on my RO system. One of the things that I discovered before starting the brew day was that the markings were slightly off in the kettle. They are within industry standard, but they're about a quarter of a gallon off based on my measurements. That is something that is very important. The first time you brew on a new system, make sure that you're measuring your water by weight and not simply trusting the markings on the kettle because they can be slightly off and oftentimes I find they are. My recipe calls for a slight amount of brewing salts. So I added a little bit of calcium chloride, some gypsum, as well as Epsom salts. I also had to adjust the pH with a little bit of lactic acid. So after getting my acid and salts added, I cranked up the SVBS, set the temperature for 155 degrees, which was my mashing temperature. I also turned on the pump and the Whirlpool port just to make sure that the water was heated evenly. Once I reached the strike temperature, it was time to mash in. I poured in all of my grains and flaked maize and then stirred it really thoroughly to make sure that all the grain was saturated. One of the steps that I have been taking recently with pretty much every brewing system that I use is I'll let the mash rest for about 10 minutes before I start recirculation. I just find it seems to allow for a better recirculation with less stuck mashes. So after I let the mash rest for 10 minutes, it was time to turn on the recirculation. I decided to go with a combination of recirculating through the center pipe as well as through the Whirlpool port as I had kind of discussed in my first look video. I'll leave a link up here for that video if you haven't seen it. Uh, the way that I did this was to turn on the pump and then open the recirculation valve all the way. And then I began opening the Whirlpool valve until the center recirculation started to drop a little bit and then kept adjusting it until I had a nice amount of recirculation over the top of the grains as well as the Whirlpool going on in the kettle. Now, during the mash process, the SVBS definitely seemed to hold a constant temperature. I didn't see any massive fluctuations or anything like that, maybe a degree or two, or you know, I don't even know if I saw two degrees, it was just maybe a degree or so, which is certainly within the, in the parameters of what I would expect to see on a system like this. Um, now, I did take a gravity reading about midway through or about 20 minutes into the mash to see if everything was converting. I like to do that sometimes just to kind of see what's going on. And uh, it did definitely indicate that there was some conversion going on. So I just let it keep going on in the mash. Now, these videos do take several hours to make, not only the brewing process, but anywhere from five or six or more hours worth of editing. So if you enjoy the video so far and, and you want to show me some love, hit that like button down below. I really do appreciate that. Now, during the mash recirculation, I didn't find any issues with a stuck mash or anything like that. Uh, the basket appeared to work pretty effectively. As far as allowing the liquid level to stay where it was initially, I mean, I didn't see any kind of rising or lowering or anything like that. Uh, after my 60 minute mash was over, I went ahead and ramped it up to 170 degrees for the mash out. As far as lifting the basket up, uh, it, was, it was pretty easy lifting it up. There wasn't any issues with being too heavy or anything like that. One of the things that I did want to point out is that 
the catches on there, you have to kind of make sure you pay attention to how the basket is oriented because the catches are around the back. Uh, you know, like if you're standing there in front of the kettle, the catch is in the back and you got to make sure that when you lift it up, you get it seated down in those catches. But wasn't a big deal, just kind of something to be aware of. So I did wind up with pretty much the exact volume that Brewfather indicated, which was 6.99 gallons. And with a slight adjustment for the markings, it was right in that range. Oh, and by the time the video goes live, the two profiles that I copied over from SS Brutex website will be available in Brewfather. I've sent them to the, the developers of Brewfather, so that will be available in the software for those of you that use Brewfather. So I let the basket drain for about 10 minutes or so. I was doing some other stuff. After about 10 minutes, I wasn't seeing any more dripping from the basket or anything like that. So removed it, switched the controller to boil and cranked it up to 100%. Uh, of course, with the size of element, it reached a boil pretty quickly and I didn't have any issues with it, you know, boiling over or anything like that. It's a 12 gallon kettle and I had like seven gallons in there. So there was like five gallons of headspace. So not a big deal. But once I reached that boil point, then I turned the element down to, to 80% and had a nice rolling boil on just over the seven gallons that I had in there. Um, there was one small boil addition. So I tossed that in and then started the timer for my boil. So at the end of the boil, uh, with about 15 minutes to go, I threw in my Whirl Flock tablet and my Jaded Skilla chiller. I wasn't 100% sure about using the immersion chiller because it would reach the bottom of the kettle and possibly sit on the coils. I did set one of the ends on my table, kind of braced it on the table a little bit, and you know, so that it wouldn't be putting the full weight down on the coils. And it didn't seem to make a difference or hurt anything at all. I mean, the, the coils looked fine after I got done with the brew day. Now the chiller designed by SS Brewtech for the system does take advantage of the catches that are in the kettle and it does hold the chiller up off of the bottom and the coil. So, you know, there is that if you want to get a chiller specifically made for it, then they do make it so that it fits in those catches. Now, obviously putting the chiller in there, dropped the system out of boil. So I cranked it back up to hundred percent. And I mean, the boil returned right back within probably less than a minute or so. Once the boil was complete, my next top addition was an ounce of Matueka at, uh, with a whirlpool of 176 degrees for 10 minutes. Uh, one thing to note on this system, if you're going to do a whirlpool at a particular temperature, you will need to switch the unit back to mash mode in order to be able to hold a temperature. Now, because the Jaded Chiller works so well, I overshot my chill down. I turned the water off prior to 176 degrees, but it just kept chilling on down. So it got down to about 160 degrees, so I had to crank the temperature you know, can't crank the element back on and get it back up to 176 degrees. Wasn't a huge issue, just one of those things. You know? <laughs> the other thing that is important on this is to recirculate through the knockout valve and the hose at the end of the boil, just to make sure everything is sanitized prior to transferring it to the fermenters. It's kind of like one of those things that, you know, you should do is put some boiling wort through all the hoses and all that stuff. I wouldn't really advise running boiling wort through the, the pump at all, but after you turn the element off, you should be fine. If you watch closely on the video here, you'll see exactly what I mean by that because there's some water that comes out of the, the hose before it actually gets to wort coming out. So, you know, things did get a little interesting when I put the Whirlpool hop addition in. The system was recirculating through the Whirlpool port fine before I added the hops. And then after I added the hops, pretty much, it pretty much stopped. I mean, it just like this, the flow cut off completely. Now I didn't use a hop screen or a hop spider on purpose because I wanted to see how the screen that the system comes with would work to filter out the hops. Now I will tell you that the flow stopped and I couldn't get any flow out of the ports. Now what I wound up doing, <laughs> as unsanitary as it may be, was I wound up opening the knockout port and leaving the Whirlpool port open. And then I just basically blew through the, the hose and it dislodged whatever was causing the issue and then everything started to flow again. So I know it's not the most sanitary and I sprayed it with some star sand and everything after I got done doing that. <laughs> but you gotta do what you gotta do, right? So once I was done with the Whirlpool, I turned the chilling water back on and while running the Whirlpool at the same time, um, what the interesting thing was I came back after about seven or 10 minutes and noticed that it was still like up in the upper 120s, 130 range for some reason. And then I remembered that the temperature probe is down in between the elements. And what happens on these type of systems is that trub and like hop debris and stuff gets down in there and it'll basically surround the temperature probe and it will insulate it so that, you know, that it's not getting the same temperature that's in the kettle. So be aware if you experience this, just stir the wart around the sensor area and it'll give you an accurate reading, you know, no problem. Once I did that, the temperature like dropped like a rock and it was pretty much all almost at a chilling temperature. I mean, a pitching temperature. So after chilling was complete, I removed the chiller to see what my volume was. And it was just below six gallons, which was very close to what my brewing software indicated that I should have. 
So I took a gravity reading on the chilled wart and came up with a reading of 1.048. Now my expected gravity was 1.054. So basically it translates to a mash efficiency of about 59%. Not the most ideal, of course, but being as this is the, like the first brew day on the system, I wasn't, you know, super disappointed. I, I definitely made beer and it's only a few points off, quite honestly. So the best thing you can really do when you start brewing on a, a new system is take notes and make sure you take really good notes about, you know, what your bash, wa what your bash was, what your crush was, all that kind of stuff. There's so many things that, that affect efficiency. You know, was it crush fine enough? Was it too fine? Was the pH correct? There's just a lot of things. And the more precise notes that you take, the more it's going to help you be able to diagnose those issues. So just remember to make good notes, especially when you're starting out brewing on a new system. So what do I think after the first brew day? Well, I think the system is definitely capable of making wort. I'm not completely sold on the screen at the bottom. I don't think that I would use a lot of hops and expect not to clog or collect all of the trub and hop debris to keep it out of your fermenter. But speaking of trub, I did find that there was quite a bit of grain bits in the boil. The holes on the mash basket are fairly small, but I think they're large enough to allow some bits of grain to come through and they just, you know, they will continue to recirculate through those holes, especially at the top up there, because this thing is completely, you know, the holes go complete, completely to the top. So, I, you know, I don't know that I would expect a completely, totally clear wart out of this system because of that. That also depends on, you know, how fine or coarse your grind is on your grain, which is, you know, always a balancing act with these is trying to get it fine enough to get a good efficiency, but not too fine to get stuck mashes or something like that. So as far as how fine my crush was, I use a mill with like six inch rollers. So it's hard to give you an exact measurement comparison, but I would say the crush that I get out of that on my mill that I use is about probably the same as I got on a two roller mill with 0.40 to 0.35 gap on the mill. So that's just where I'm at with it. So if your crush is, you know, coarser or finer than that, then, you know, you can compare my results to, to what you use normally. Uh, leave me a comment down below. Let me know what your thoughts are after seeing the first brew day. I look forward to seeing your comments down below. If you haven't subscribed, make sure you do so if, so you won't miss a video when it comes out. This has been Brian for Short Circuit of Brewers. We'll see you on the next video.